So I used to think that I would be able to tell the uh, some of you who are younger about how to use drugs. <laughs> but a couple of weeks ago, I gave a talk at, at UC, and I did tell people how to use drugs, but I also asked everyone what drugs they'd used and how they'd used them. And everybody in the audience seemed to have used more drugs in more ways than I had. <laughs> and it was, so I felt a little embarrassed. <laughs> but it turned out that one of the few things that, that I seemed to be pushing on that was less popular with many of you was what I call having a guide. Um, and a guide is, you know, at the, the, the lowest level, uh, it's the designated driver. When you go, you know, uh, alcohol, I forget what we call it, stoned, you know, there's a lot of words that overlap. Um, and the reason that I recommended guides so strongly, and I, and I still do, even though I know it makes me a kind of psychedelic right winger, <laughs> is that there's a lot of ways to use these substances. And my theory is that there is a best and highest use. And that best and highest use is to discover and keep in mind more fully who you really are and who everyone else really is and to what extent you are part of everything and to what extent you think there are divisions because visually it looks like there are divisions but obviously even logically which is a kind of slowest dumbest part of the mind uh, we're all connected right i'm connected literally because um, we're all mushed in the same bowl of air and we're basically you know breathing each other's breaths and that we're connected emotionally and uh, a number of you who I've seen together are connected physically right now, like this moment. And you obviously are carrying in you thousands of species of bacteria and viruses. In fact, you, in fact, like about a third of your body weight is literally other organisms and that they're all trying to work it out all the time. They're all trying to live in harmony. And so inside us is this incredible diversity of species whose only goal is to kind of work it out. Now, some of them eat the others, and some of them, you know, sometimes you're food and sometimes you're the eater, but there's a whole system going on inside everyone that it's a lot like what New Age people talk about when they talk about, you know, what human beings should be. And so, and even within a cell, there's again thousands of different things kind of working it out. So we're, we're so complex and so interdependent on each other that forgetting that seems to be the equivalent of what Christianity calls the fall. And it's the fall from grace. And what's grace? Grace is remembering that incredible connection. And how do you get back once you've fallen? Well, a number of you seem to know. <laughs> That's why you're here. But a number of you have kind of only touched at the edges of that. Um, I remember when I first was, um, I first got psilocybin from, from Ram Dass, who was then Professor Richard Alpert. And what came out of that was exactly what that group was doing, which was um, a kind of I-thou, where you were incredibly more aware of your connection to other people, but almost as a kind of friendship, kind of as an agape kind of love. And so that you could literally ask anyone else in the group for anything, and they would give it to you, but you wouldn't ask them unless you had thought it through that it was not gonna be you know, oppressive or greedy or difficult. So you, you were cooperating the way your body likes to cooperate. And that's what they were doing. And that was what was turning their lives around. Because I met them, this was with Leary and Alpert, were going off to Copenhagen to meet up with Aldous Huxley. And they were going to give the first presentation to an international psychological blah, blah, blah about something. 
But that's where they were, was I thou. And then I came out west and I met with a group that became called the International Foundation for Advanced Study, which um, had a, a series of offices over a beauty shop which looked out over a parking lot in Menlo Park, um, one of the great romantic settings of our time. And in the suite of offices, a couple of them were built like living rooms, and that's where people developed the whole notion of uh, eye shades and um, headphones and music and a comfortable place. Uh, because earlier people had said, well, you, you know, it's a drug, you shoot people up, you sit them in an empty room, and in a couple hours they come down and you do something else with them. <laughs> and I'd been working with those people because I was their psychologist. Now, I was a first-year graduate student, and as an undergraduate, I'd taken almost no psychology, so they, were, they weren't getting much. And I said that, and they said, look, <laughs> you're all we've got. And then they kind of indicated that I didn't really know what they were talking about. And I, who'd had vast numbers, three, of psilocybin sessions <laughs> on an I-thou basis, kind of medium to low dose, knew they were wrong because we were so close. And so they said, well, why don't you just take it with us once? So I showed up and took my, out of my little silver cup, whatever, probably 200 micrograms. And then I, I looked around and I waited for my, my guide, who was a full professor of electrical engineering. And he didn't take anything. And I thought, wait a moment, this is friendship. We just take stuff together. And he said, okay, I'll take something. I think he took a little speed. <laughs> and I had a, a woman guide, and I watched them for a while, and we talked for a little while, and then I thought, I'd rather lie down. <laughs> In fact, I am lying down. <laughs> and yes, yeah, thank you for the eye shade. Ooh, the music. Some hours later, <laughs> I got that the eye thou was really nice. But it had, it was like a hundred thousandth of what was real. And what I got was, as I looked into the faces of these people, is they were telling me that there is something that has created civilization itself, that may have created life itself, and that I was able to partake of it, not as a, um, not kind of as a buyer or as a, you know, as being given something, but that I was part of it. And that creation itself was a kind of undivided wave. And that living and dying were kind of like little sine waves. And that that's what we were doing all the time. Some of us were living and some of us were dying, and the people who were dying and then would be living, and the people who were living, and so forth and that there was a kind of unbroken system. In a sense, it's like, um, it's like when people um, mine gold and make it into coins. In a, in, a, in a sense, if you look at the whole world, nothing happened. The gold was in a hole in South Africa. Then it got moved to another hole under a bank. <laughs> and in 100,000 years, someone will discover that hole, and they'll mine it. And they'll find, where can they put all this gold? And they'll find, but these great big holes in South Africa are empty. <laughs> and from the planet's point of view, none of the gold ever left. <clears throat> Just circulated, kind of the way your blood circulates. So there was this awareness that I was part of the circulatory system. And that I was uh, privileged only in that I had noticed it. And I remember I went up in the hills above Stanford with my guide, and I looked out and I thought, I really did a good job. <laughs> what about those trees? How <laughs> about the grass? Hey, my stuff. <laughs> and it, was a, a, it wasn't a vanity, it was just kind of a, um, how nice that I, that I who had created everything um, and was now in, kind of dripping into Jim Fadiman's head. I'd done such a good job. 
And that was the kind of, then the, the next week was awkward because I was a first year graduate student in psychology. And my professors clearly didn't know this. Uh, they didn't know it a lot. And if I brought it up at all, it was clear that I was endangering my rather fragile <coughs> position there. And if I had been in a reasonable culture, I would have just walked out. But my government had offered me an alternative to graduate school. And they said, we've got this great place in Southeast Asia. <laughs> And we'll, we'll give you your clothes, and we'll give you your boots, and we'll give you your gun. And you can crawl on the mud, through the mud, with a gun in your el you know, kind of held between your elbows, and you can shoot people that you don't know. Well, that's a little bit the way I was. That was like saying, here is a hammer, and here is your thumb. And if your thumb is bothering you, you can just whack at it with a hammer. And most of us would say, that's insane because I'm also my thumb. And I was aware that I was also the people in Southeast Asia. So I stayed in psychology, grumbling the entire time. And secretly, at night, trying to figure out what the fuck had happened to me and what it meant and did anyone else ever have this experience. So I'm reading you know, the kind of psychology junk some of you are reading in the daytime. And I'm reading the I Ching at night, and I'm reading um, the life of Milo Repa, who was a Tibetan, and St. John of the Cross. And I'm thinking, okay, these are my buddies. These guys are struggling to deal with the same problem of what do you do once you have acquired this particular not knowledge, it's even, that's too shallow. This, <clears throat> this realization that transforms the way you see everything. And so I kind of tiptoed my way through graduate school, slipping in a master's thesis dealing with psychedelics and a doctoral dissertation dealing with psychedelics, mainly so I could spend time with the people doing psychedelic research. So I, I, at one point I talked to my Stanford people into um, the fact that I needed to give a two-minute test to people, but the only way I could do it was to st spend eight hours with them while they were taking psychedelics so I wouldn't disturb them. And professors of psychology, being as they were, thought that was very noble of me. So I got training. I got to sit through all these great training sessions with people getting their, getting helped with psychedelic therapy. And what I told the people is, I'll be with you all day, I'll be, I'll be helpful. Uh, if you need it, you probably won't need it. And I apologize, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna ask you a few really silly questions. And I won't disturb you, it won't take long. And understand that we both will know how silly it is. And I hope you will do that. And so I managed to collect my little bit of data and so forth. And so then the government, I mean, a couple of years later, we were still doing research. And we were actually doing research, a whole breakthrough. We, would, we were finding out, could you take, not this divine revelation, which is what interested me, but could you take hard scientists who had not any psychedelic experience and use psychedelics to help them solve hard science problems? Super rational stuff. And the general agreement in the psychedelic underworld, such as we were, was no. And the agreement from the rational scientific world was no possible way. This is, after all, a psychotomimetic drug. How could that make sense for rational science? But my guide, this full professor, said he thought we could make it work. And I thought, sure. So we developed what's called a protocol these days. We just thought of it as an experiment. And we figured out some rules. And we um, figured out that one of the things you do is you tell people that this works. Not only it works, it works fantastically. And that 
this session that we're going to give you guys tomorrow is going to give you perhaps the most creative day of your life. Now, for our first group, we had no idea that this was true at all. But, you know, when you are, when you own the deck of cards, you stack the deck. And we, we thought it might work. And so we ended up with these four senior scientists lying on the floor, <laughs> headphones, <laughs> eye shades, light dose, I don't know if light is light, for you, 100 mics. And at the peak of their experience, we kind of got them up and said, now you get to work on your problems. And they did. They did not wander off into bliss. They did not go into psychotherapeutic problems. They did not go into little hell whirlpools. They did not find that the, the lines on their hand were infinitely interesting. <laughs> <laughs> they worked on their scientific problems. They didn't talk to each other. And at the end of the day, People were starting to come down and we they shared a little bit and they basically said, Whoa, well, this has been the most creative day of my life. And I had this breakthrough in this area and I saw this and so forth. And we they left and we then, you know, took off our little scientific neutrality and ran around the room and squealed and said, My God, it really does work. You know? <laughs> and so we did a bunch of those. And then the federal government <coughs> decided that all psychedelic research in the United States was going to stop. 60 projects, including people giving it to mice, and giving it to bacteria, I mean just, when our government moves, intelligence is not the method. <laughs> so we got a letter that said, as of the receipt of this letter, your investigational drug license is canceled. We had four guys lying in the room. <laughs> and I was the youngest member of the group, and I said, I think we got the letter tomorrow. <laughs> we agreed. Went in, our last four scientists had their last major breakthroughs, <coughs> and off we went. So suddenly I was not only out a career, but as I realized some years later, I was also out of religion. I was also out of spiritual practice. That I had basically been kind of cut off on both ends. So I did a lot of other things until you guys started <laughs> to appear. And the government in the last couple of years, um, they haven't really relaxed. But what they've said is, we've had these unbelievably hard rules in order to do some research. And we simply made it clear that no one could ever get through the rules, but there were rules. And then some years ago, people started to say, well, if you actually can obey all these amazing rules, then you can do some research. And MAPS, in a sense, has been hanging on through a lot of the darkness into this time when for a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of time and an amazing amount of different agencies, you can do some original research and some kind of repeat research of stuff we already knew is true. And if you're going to do research, start with stuff you already know works. Um, that's easier. And so that's where we are now. And however, in that little 40-year lull, I used to call it repressed era, but one of the other researchers called it a lull. <coughs> With that coming around, what happened in between is that 23 million Americans took LSD during the time when it was not only illegal and Schedule One and so forth and so on, bad for them. Then, of course, ecstasy, another 14 million and then marijuana, and the total number of people who've done an illegal act around a substance in the United States is now about 140 million. So all we have to do is vote <laughs> as a block, and we're in. So 
I'm now in a position, and, and I thought some years ago, um, I wrote an essay for a book about, about these kind of incidents. And someone in my family who's a really good writer said, there's a book in there. And I thought, a book about my adventures in the drug trade. What could be more interesting to me, <laughs> as it turned out? So I spent a whole summer down here in Santa Cruz kind of studying myself, getting out old notes and old notebooks and reading the books that had come out during various times that I should have known about and kind of getting it, getting, getting this memoir going. You know, Angela's Ashes and Jim's Dope. And then I had this epiphany, which is who cared? about my adventures, you know. Who had I slept with, who had I not slept with, who had I taken drugs with, what famous names had I done any of those with. And I realized that the people who were interested were smaller than my Christmas card list. And I thought, but then why did I put in all these months of effort? See, I believe actually that, that not only it takes a village, but that you have a small village inside you and you may have other entities that are helpful. Um, the shamanistic people are very clear that shamans have helpers. Um, and I figure anything that's been working for 40,000 years or more, probably you should look at it. <laughs> and the fact that modern Western science doesn't look at it, you know, how, how old is modern Western science? So I kind of said to the various entities, do you guys have something in mind? because I don't think this memoir is worth my writing. And then the question came is, is there anything I know that most people don't? And the answer was that I'd actually participated in all kinds of parts of psychedelic research. You know, Stan Groff has seen thousands of people in therapy, but he's never worked with any scientists. And, the, and so forth and so on. And then also microdosing came along. That's taking enough, just a tiny bit so that the people next to you don't know. And you can still go to your um, you know, quantitative analysis lab and just do work. And so I realized I kind of had a foot in a lot of camps and therefore there were things that I could tell people that most people didn't know or had forgotten. And it's silly to recreate. So I did write a book, and my original title, which was wonderful, which was called Shattering Certainty, which seemed to me the best way to describe psychedelic experience, and that it was something I took from Carlos Castaneda. And my publisher said, nah, we've got to put psychedelic in the title. And so, the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide was a, a compromise from some really awful titles. And the notion was that people could make use of this and could make their own mistakes and not make, you know, mistakes we'd already made and kind of really work through. And so now what's happening is I'm getting a lot of letters from a lot of very amazing people who have been using things in their own remarkable ways. And so we're finding, I'm finding out by kind of asking people to tell me their stories about all kinds of ways of using these substances that none of us knew about and that aren't indigenous. You know, the wonderful thing about the indigenous people is they, various groups, and some of you have worked with them, um, they really know what they're doing. And they have been doing it within one context. And what's happening is we're beginning to blend really Western science, which is not evil, it's just dumb. You know, but it's got some wonderful tools. You know, because real science is anything counts. You know, you, real science is everything that, that exists is something you can look at. Kind of dumb science is you have to have something you can count. Or that you can use a tool with and so or that you can replicate. I would say, well, you don't have to be able to replicate your experiment. I say, what about astronomers? They don't do any experiments at all. Are they not scientists? Well, that's different. And then I begin to realize this is not going to go well. 
and eventually they're going to say, you use a lot of drugs, don't you? <laughs> so we let it go. So anyway, that's what I've been doing. And then I thought, well, you put out a book and um, not everybody reads it. So then what's the most important part of the book from my side, which is that people who use psychedelics should use them the best way possible and the least bad way possible. How many of you have had a bad trip? Okay. I'd like those to be fewer hands. Right? How many of you had a bad trip that remained as a bad trip in your mind that didn't turn out to be just a challenging trip and that you learned a lot? Well, then, so you're really the one I want to talk to. So I put out, you know, so I, I made a whole big thing about what's the best way to take a trip. And I put that out on a free site so that people would not have to buy a book. Now, it's awkward to say that on an evening when Maps wants you to buy books. So I don't think I'll tell you where to find it. <laughs> but if you look at it in theoguide.net, that's a hint. Because what's important is that not only you don't have bad trips, but that your good trips are so good that they reinforce the kind of life that you would like to lead. And so in some sense, um, I, I talked to a group down on 20th Street one night, and the guy who invited me said, you know, I looked at your book. And I never knew that you could take psychedelics for anything more than dropping and going to a concert. <laughs> now this was not a college student, because he knew notebooks. <laughs> and I thought, and he said, would you, he said, would you be willing to talk to some friends of mine? I thought, would I? Uh, Woo. It's kind of like first guy in the village that discovered condoms. <laughs> Have I got something to show you? <laughs> and out of that evening, what I really got was that, that the, the yes, 23 million people have taken LSD, but how many people have really taken it where it can take you? And that's what interests me. Okay? And so that's what I'm up to is... Um, not pushing the envelope, but kind of opening the envelope. And so when I do some media and I talk about people who've overcome, and then I mention a list of fascinating things like stuttering. There's a couple of people out there who had one session and got over stuttering. How about allergies? Any of you have allergies? Okay. One session. Now, the, the, I have one case which is easy because it's Andy Weil, a very famous MD. Um, but I just got one in the mail from somebody in Thailand who took LSD and then took the stuff he was allergic to and said, I'm not going to be allergic to you anymore. <laughs> now, I know at MAPS you say, well, what was the double blind? <laughs> what was the protocol? The answer was, he wasn't blind at all. <laughs> he knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to see people with less allergies. I'd like to pe see people who don't stutter. I'd be happy if everybody was divinely realized and didn't think that going to other countries and killing them was like a virtuous act. But I'm, I'm willing to start with, you know, where we are. So in some sense, I'm really looking at what's the next part of my, um, what I'm supposed to do. You know, I long ago gave up um, figuring that I knew what I was doing. But I'm much more open to finding out what I'm doing. Right? So when people say, what do you want? I say, I don't know, what do you want? You know, I'm like, a, you know, like, you've been on a date like that? You know, where do you want to eat? I don't know where you want. I want to eat it. No, that's all right. <laughs> You're supposed to guess until you get the one that I won't tell you. <laughs> right? So that's what I'm up to. And so this evening, as I said when I got up here, I thought I was going to come and sit in the corner and sign a few books and 
scarf a few, I think, totally safe pastries. <laughs> but one, maybe, maybe it's kind of like, um, I forget, various holidays have like a cake with a hidden, you know, one piece has a hidden coin. So if you eat enough of her, brown, you may get the one. The thousand Mike cake. But I'm not going to tell you which one. I may have to just keep eating to find out. So that's what I'm here for. And, and if, why don't we take a few questions and then we'll do something else or comments or the only thing we won't take is I want to tell you about my trip because I know about your trip okay and the person next to you doesn't but talk to them about it. yes please yeah yeah the, the question about the computer industry and psychedelics aside from Steve Jobs that kind of handles most of the computer industry. But, you know, Steve said his LSD experiences were among the most important experiences of his life. And that's, that's one place. Did he, you know, turn on and then an iPod appeared and he wrote it, you know, no. No, he actually invented all this. But what we do know is if you went around, particularly during the dot-com bubble when uh, companies were run by very, very young people, the amount of the number of people who indeed were using psychedelics to create what they were doing in their companies was quite large. Now there is one holdover from that. How many of you have been to Burning Man? Oh, okay. Have you noticed the art? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> have you noticed the drug use? Okay. So there's a huge amount of that drug creativity which is certainly visible in Burning Man and other places. Um, when I talk about scientists and I'm being systematic about it, uh, again, my notion is that if you are really trying to use a drug for a particular purpose, then that's what you should be doing. That's a focus. And the more focus, the better the results. Um, now, I'm sure, you know, if I walk around Burning Man saying that, a whole bunch of people will beat me up, but hopefully there'll be stones that'll be very gentle beating. <laughs> Yes, please. Um, do you find the difference Is there a difference between a plant-based um, substance like psilocybin from a mushroom or mescaline from peyote versus from a lab, right? Mescaline from Pfizer or something, right? <laughs> Albert Hoffman. And if you don't know who Albert Hoffman is, you're just bad people. <laughs> Albert Hoffman, who, you know, at age 102 was still giving lectures, um, said that the difference between synthetic psilocybin and the mushroom psilocybin existed in the minds of the people who preferred one over the other. And that was the only difference he could find. Um, personally, the fact that a plant made it or that a, a person, which is, you know, the same thing as a plant, that a human made it using other things isn't a big distinction for me. And if you look at the molecule, it looks a lot alike. Now, the one difference, and it's a very real difference, um, how many of you have had peyote? Okay. Peyote has in it mescaline. It has 42 other alkaloids. I figure nature had some reason for doing that. Because if you've ever tried to find peyote, peyote has no enemies. <laughs> Nothing wants to eat peyote. <laughs> okay. And it's small and ugly and you know nobody brushes by it and breaks it. I mean it really has its own little quiet life. So what's it doing with 43 alkaloids? Particularly, what are these plants doing? Let's take your question up. What are these plants doing having alkaloids that have this remarkable effect on human beings? And many of these plants are older than human beings. So what's going on? Now, 
I admit once I did ask that question in a state of heightened awareness, shall we say. And the answer was that I can put a psychedelic in any plant I choose, any time I choose. Because I was actually asking about morning glory seeds at the time. And the morning glory seeds, by the way, that have LSA, lysergic acid, which is one hundredth the power of LSD, but that's enough. The brands of morning glory seeds, and you wonder, someone in the 1930s in the Burpee company that, you know, that made names for seeds, Pearly Gates, <laughs> what's the other one? Heavenly Blue. And there's still one more that has a similar name. So, what is it? Right. <laughs> so there's there's some interesting things going on. And so the answer to your question is, set and setting are maximally important. The substance is important. Ayahuasca and LSD are not the same in any way, shape, or form. And the particular nature of the substance may be of some difference. But when you're matching for dose, and you're, you're really looking at that in the setting, the difference is so small as to be uninteresting. So the answer is there probably is some difference. And the, the science people, I was talking to a health editor, and his, his job, it was from a whole, a whole something magazine. And his editor had said, only ask about plants. And I said, well, and he said, and also ask about research. And I said, well, the problem is the researchers don't like plants because you can't measure real type. And he said, well, maybe we could work psilocybin in because you've said they're kind of the same. So there is an issue about plants. And the other issue is actually much more important, which is certain plants are known to be teaching plants. Meaning, if you have taken them, as ayahuasca in particular, is a teacher. And if you, because if you ask ayahuasca, it says, I'm a teacher. And people talk about mama ayahuasca, and it has a whole, you know, it's a relationship. Nobody talks about mama LSD. And partly because LSD doesn't have an agenda. Plants have an agenda. Their agenda is probably to stop us from screwing up the whole planet so that the plants suffer. I think the plants on the whole will be thrilled if we wipe ourselves out. I know Ivy particularly is excited by the idea. <laughs> but looking at the difference between plants and synthetics, and that's the major difference, is there's a whole bunch of plants which are known as teaching plants. And that's very different. Uh, some of you may have done a mix of chemicals that mimics ayahuasca. As far as I know, and again, you know more than I do, very rarely when someone does that do they say, it, it, it said it was a teacher. So that may be the real difference. It's not at the physical or the chemical or the biological, but something about the essential nature of the rest of the plant. So it's a, it's a wonderfully difficult question, and I tried to get away with just the easy, quick answer, but you kept looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, no, I can't get away with it. <laughs> okay. How about one more question? Yes, please. Uh, you no, you're going to have to be much, much louder and pretend you have a deeper voice. Can you define nothing as something worth? I'm not, I'm not getting it. I'm sorry. Come on, come on. Talk to me. Define what? Define nothing as something? You want me to do that? You want to wrap it out of my armpit too? You didn't see it? That's a working definition, isn't it? Well, it's your question. See the question you're you're you know asking, you know something nothing. That's kind of like saying what's going on in a black hole. And the answer is I don't know because it's dark. 
Okay? The, the thing that you might look at is what's behind your question. Meaning, what would be an answer that would work for you? Because it feels almost as if it's a silly question, but I don't get that vibe from you. Yeah, it's definitely a very serious question. Yeah. Um, the question of, of does something arise from nothing, and the answer is absolutely any time you do a creative act. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Oh, good. <laughs> One of the things you learn when you're in this kind of game is when you don't have any idea what to say, you just keep talking. <laughs> and in the back of your mind, you know, the thing is working and working and working. And then you, you know, you, so, so, you know, I'm sure that if I were more of the kind of spiritualist type, I'd say, my guy, it's that's it. <laughs> I used to channel an Indian, a wise Indian, you know, he would, he would come through Jim Fadim and, and he would say very amusing things in an Indian accent so that people would be very impressed and hopefully leave him money. <laughs> because as you know, most Indian gurus who have no possessions like money. <laughs> but I gave that up because that seemed to be trivial. Okay, it's getting cold. I mean, it is cold. We have achieved cold. <laughs> and. Uh, as I say, there's uh, there's uh, sugar rushes over there. There's wine somewhere. These beautiful glasses, unless these people brought their own. Okay, downstairs. There's a bookstore, and and just so you know, there's an amazing amount of good information that wasn't available a few years ago. There's a certain amount of lousy information that wasn't available a few years ago, but on the whole, the map store has a good sifter. So. Enjoy yourselves, and it looks like there's going to be a lot more action. And again, I'm just, I am always feel like in Santa Cruz, everything that we tried to do in the 60s, you've retained as much as possible. And so as it comes back, it's easier in Santa Cruz. Somehow, when I'm in Kansas, it's not as easy to find you all. At least not in daylight, you know, where other people can hear. All right, thanks very much.